Good morning and welcome to the seventh meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2016. As usual at this point, I, I ask those uh, who are with us this morning not to use any mobile phones uh, as they can interfere with uh, the committee proceedings, but uh, I also ask you to note that uh, there are many of us using tablet devices instead of uh, our hard copies of the papers. Um, the first item on our agenda this, the, this morning um, is uh, a declaration of interest, and I, I welcome Fiona McLeod as a new member of uh, the committee. And before I invite um, um, Fiona McLeod to declare any relevant interest, I want to put on record um, my appreciation, and I'm sure I'll speak for the committee. And thanks to Bob Doris, who has left the committee. Hopefully, uh, you know he's. I feel a bit nervous this morning. He's been on my shoulder throughout this time and the previous committee, so he's my deputy convener for a number of years, so I feel a bit strange this morning. Um, so, uh, um, Fiona, I can I invite you to declare any relevant interests? Thank you, convener. I have no relevant interest to declare. And can I say that I'm grateful to be back on the committee, even if it is just to cover Bob Doris's paternity leave? Thank you, Fiona. Um, we now move to agenda item number two, which is the choice of deputy convener. The Parliament has agreed uh, that only members of the Scottish Nationalist Party uh, um, are eligible for nom nomination as deputy convener uh, of the committee. That being the case, I, I can I invite uh, a nominations for the position of deputy convener. I nominate Fiona McLeod. Thank you. We have no other nominations um, uh, received, and I therefore ask the committee to agree that Fiona McLeod be chosen as deputy convener of the committee. Are we all agreed? Great. Thank you. Congratulations, Fiona, and welcome back to the committee. And we look forward to working with you, uh, albeit um, uh, on a temporary basis. We now move on now to agenda item number three, and I invite uh, members uh, to agree to take consideration of the evidence on palliative care at agenda item number seven in private at this meeting and indeed uh, uh, if, uh, at any future meetings if the need arises. Are we all agreed? agreed? Thank you. We now move to agenda item number four, um, which of course is uh, um, the stage two, the two consideration of the health, uh, tobacco, nicotine, etc. care Scotland bill. Can I welcome the Minister, Maureen Watt, Minister for Public Health. Um, good morning and welcome, Minister. Um, Dan Curran, uh, Bill Policy Manager. Uh, Craig White, uh, Divisional Clinical Lead. Lynn Nicholl, Quality Team Leader. Elsa Garland, Principal Legal Officer. Meryl Skeen, Parliamentary Council. And I should also at this point welcome uh, uh, Mary Scanlon, who is here for this item of the agenda, welcome back to the Health Committee. Thank you. Uh, Mary, there are lots of... It's like, uh, one of those... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that, um, the member should note that um, uh, partway through the, the morning stage two, I will pause proceedings to enable uh, the government officials to change over, to change over at that point, um, and, and I'll um, introduce the other officials at that point. Everybody should have a, a, a copy of the bill as introduced, the matter of list of amendments and the groupings of amendments. There will be one debate, uh, as you all know now, on each group of amendments, and I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak and move that amendment and to speak to other amendments in the group. <coughs> Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate by catching my attention in the usual way. The debate on the group will be concluded by, by me inviting the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up. Only committee members uh, are allowed to vote. Voting in any of the divisions is by a show of hands. The committee is required to indicate formally that it is considered and agreed each section of the schedule of the bill. And, I, and, and so I will put... Uh, a question on each section at the appropriate point. And I move to the Marshall list and uh, I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendment 4. Uh, Minister to move Amendment 3 and spoke, speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. 
These amendments in my name relate to outcomes of incidents which trigger the duty of candour procedure. Amendment 3 addresses an issue which was raised by North Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership in written evidence to the committee at stage 1. The duty of candour procedure can be triggered by an unexpected or unintended incident which results in the affected person needing treatment to prevent their death or injury. At the moment, the Bill provides that treatment given to prevent death or injury would trigger the duty of candour procedure only where that treatment was given by a registered doctor. This amendment will change this so that the procedure would be activated by an incident which results in the affected person needing treatment by a registered health professional. The definition of registered health professional is wider as it includes not only doctors but also nurses, midwives, paramedics and dentists as well as others. An unintended or unexpected incident in the course of treatment or care in health or social care settings could result in the intervention of any one of a number of health professionals in order to prevent death or injury. This amendment reflects that reality. Convener, Amendment 4 also relates to outcomes of incidents which trigger the duty of candour procedure. One of those outcomes is that the affected person requires treatment to prevent certain injuries. Amendment 4 will add another category to the types of treatment which will trigger the duty of candour procedure. This added category, which is set out in Section 21.4b, covers incidents which result in permanent lessening of one or more functions of the body and is, is described as severe harm. The effect of the amendment is that if, as a result of an incident, a person requires treatment to prevent se se severe harm, this will trigger the duty of candour procedure. <clears throat> I'm glad to have the opportunity to bring forward this amendment, which does not reflect a change in the intended policy, but corrects an, an omission in the Bill as introduced. So for these reasons, I would ask the Committee to support Amendments 3 and 4, and I move Amendment 3. Uh, do any other members wish? I don't see any other members wishing to comment uh, or take part here. Um, I presume you don't need to say any more, Minister. Thank you. And the question is then that Amendment 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 3. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question uh, is then that Section 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I call now Amendment 11 in the name of Rhoda Grant, grouped with Amendment 12. Rhoda Grant to move Amendment 11 and speak to both amendments in the group. Can I move Amendment 11 and speak to both 11 and 12? Um, the Bill outlines a duty of candour in quite extreme circumstances, and I think it was helpful to have the previous amendments because it just highlights how extreme those circumstances are. It also outlines a bureaucracy and reporting process for those very significant incidents. My amendments ensure that the duty of candour is required in not all circumstances. Patients must be at the heart of their own treatment. They must know what's going on in order to have faith in the system. We've um, moved away from a point where clinicians uh, made decisions decisions they believed were in the best interests of the patients and put patients at the heart of that decision making but we need to go further and I don't want to set up another bureaucracy um, but I simply want to ensure that patients are informed and able to make decisions of themselves so when the incident isn't of um, such extreme proportions they should be at least informed of what has happened um, so that they can decide uh, for themselves. A lot of professional organisations have a duty of candour stipulated by their own governing bodies, but we heard in evidence that this is not the case for all, and therefore moving these amendments mean that patients are informed about their own treatment and any, um, any adverse circumstances. Okay. Any other members before I go to the Minister? No? Minister. Thank you, Convener. Amendments 11 and 12 would require unintended or unexpected incidents which do not or could not result in harm or injury to be reported to a person whose care has been affected. 
The result of this would be an unreasonable and unnecessary burden on health, social care and social work organisations. Furthermore, it departs from the principles which have led us to propose the duty of candour. The purpose of the statutory duty of candour for organisations is to require that organisations implement procedures where there has been an unintended or unexpected event resulting in death or harm, or which could have resulted in death or harm, but for the treatment given by a healthcare professional. I believe we should focus on cases where real harm has occurred or where there is a risk that real harm could occur, rather than creating statutory requirements on organisations in every case where no harm has occurred. Rhoda Grant's amendments would remove that focus and require that everything that happens, which is unintended or unexpected, to be judged to assess if care has been affected. Also, that incidents should be reported to an affected individual, whether or not there is a negative outcome of that event. I do not think that such a procedure would be helpful to those receiving care or treatment, nor to the staff who deliver our health, social care and social work services. The introduction of the statutory duty of candour must not become a box-ticking or form-filling exercise. I believe that the procedure proposed by these amend amendments is not proportionate. I also believe that such an additional procedure would result in the duty of candour for cases where real harm has occurred becoming diluted and not having the desired impact on culture change, safety and learning. So for these reasons, I'd ask Rhoda Grant to withdraw Amendment 11 and not move Amendment 12. Rhoda Grant to wind up, please, I withdraw. I, I really don't um, understand um, what the Minister is trying to see. Um, um, she herself stipulated the circumstances that a duty of candour come in. So it's death or real harm. I mean, those are extreme circumstances. My amendment is saying that if, some, if an unexpected incident occurs in the provision of the health service, a care service or social work service to a person, and the reasonable opinion of the registered health professional of that, that, that is that that incident affected a person's care, but did not result in in death or or or, or extreme harm? Then that person should be informed of what happened, given an account of the incident, told about what steps were taken to put it right, and any other information they require. Very simple. Something has gone wrong. This is what has happened. This is what we've done. There is no added bureaucracy. There is no. Um, tick box exercise and it seems to me extreme um, that the Minister could be um, saying that people aren't entitled to that very basic information about their own treatment. I will take the amendment away and have a look at it in light of the unintended consequences I think that were somewhat overstated um, by the Minister um, but I am really concerned that if she doesn't believe that patients should have that information of their treatment I don't know what kind of leadership that provides to health service professionals. The member seeking to withdraw the amendment. Any other member object? No member objected. Uh, member uh, 11 is withdrawn. I now call Amendment uh, 17 in the name of Malcolm Chisholm and a group on its own, Malcolm Chisholm, to move and speak to Amendment. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm a strong supporter of the duty of candour, but um, obviously various concerns have been expressed by um, clinicians, and the particular concern that, 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 that this amendment uh, picks up is uh, something that was expressed to those of us who visited uh, Ardgowan Hospice in uh, Greenock um, back in September. The main purpose of our visit, obviously, was as part of our palliative care inquiry, but we also took the opportunity of asking the clinicians who work there about uh, this part of the bill. And uh, I think, the, in, in summary, the concern was that some people uh, might not want uh, to be told uh, and obviously, in terms of their situation, that was particularly uh, people who were uh, in a hospice, but of course it could well be uh, other uh, people uh, as well. So this, this is a matter I raised uh, as part of the evidence session on the 22nd of September, and I thought the comment by Peter Walsh of Action, Action Against Medical Accidents was very interesting. It's actually 
in, on column nine, uh, in column nine of the official report of the 22nd of September. And um, it would be helpful perhaps if I could read what he said. Um, the point about some people, I'm quoting now, not wanting to know uh, that a mistake has been made is a valid one. One must respect each individual's wishes. When the discussions took place in England about its version of, a, uh, of the duty of candour, we made that very point. The way that it has been dealt with in England is that there is a requirement to tell the patient or service user or their family that there is something to report and to, and to discuss. And they can simply say, thanks, but I don't want to know. Let us say that mum or dad has passed away. The family can say, we're moving on and we don't want to know another thing. That is their absolute right, but it is not the right of any individual health professional or organisation to decide for them that they do not need the opportunity to know. And I think that's the end of the quote. I think the last part is absolutely fundamental to this because clearly we're moving away from a paternalistic culture where health professionals decide whether someone is to be told or not. But I think there, is no, there can be no objection in principle to a health professional asking if somebody wants to know because then the decision is entirely the matter, uh, the concern and the decision of the relevant individual. So that uh, approach uh, that uh, um, uh, is adopted in England is what I've tried to uh, incorporate in, uh, in, uh, in um, my um, proposed uh, amendment uh, 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 today and um, the details of it, if I can actually find it in the, in the book, which I can't at the moment. The numbers are all confusing me here. Um, basically, um, first section repeats what I've said, the responsible person must ask the relevant person, and then the second um, uh, section uh, describes what um, has to happen then in terms of a written uh, record uh, of the communication. So I think that does protect against any abuse of this uh, requirement, but uh, I think um, there are quite a lot of clinicians and I think perhaps members of the public who would be concerned if people didn't have the right to say that they didn't want to know. So I move Amendment 17. Thank you. No other members. Annette Millen. Yes, thank you, Convener. Just to say that I would support Malcolm Chisholm in, in this, this amendment. I, I was particularly struck by the evidence that we received um, about the, the procedure uh, in England. And uh, so having, having grown up through a very paternalistic health service, I think this is probably a, a good step in the right direction. Thank, thank you. you. No other members? Minister. Thank you, Convener. This amendment in Malcolm Chisholm's name would require that responsible persons ask the person affected by an unintended or unexpected incident which causes harm whether or not they wish the duty of candour procedure to apply to them. I acknowledge that it may not always be in the best interests of the, of the individual to be told about what has happened and organisations will be required to consider this carefully and ensure that they do not have a one-size-fits-all approach to disclosing information. Additionally, not everyone may wish to know the details of what has happened, and of course this should always be an option. The Scottish Government's Guidance Development Group will consider these issues as part of its remit in, in taking forward the implementation of the Bill. While recognising that the procedure should as far as possible take into account the preferences of those affected by unintended or unexpected incidents. An undesirable effect of the amendment may be that where an affected person doesn't want to be told about an incident, the wider duty of candour procedure may not apply. We still would want reporting and learning to take place to prevent the same type of incident happening again. As members will be aware, under the bill, the duty of candour procedure is a series of steps to be taken by the responsible person. Section 22 of the Bill leaves the detailed steps in that procedure to be taken forward in regulations. Under Section 22 2A, the regulations may make provision about the notification to be given to the relevant person affected, and Section 22 2E allows the regulations to provide detail on the account of the incident which is to be given. I intend that the regulations under Section 22 setting out the duty of candour procedure will reflect the aim of this amendment, 
to the extent that the purpose is to provide an affected person with the opportunity to decline to be told about what went wrong. However, it's important that in such cases, the wider duty of candour procedure continues to apply to the responsible person so that lessons can be learned from these incidents, even where someone doesn't want to know what happened. Therefore, having set out that intention, I would ask Malcolm Chisholm to withdraw Amendment 17. Thank you. Malcolm Chisholm. Well, I thank the um, Minister for that explanation. I, I'm still not entirely clear. To some extent, I'm not sure if she really is objecting to the substance of this at all, because uh, she said that um, she'll actually make sure it's delivered in regulation. So I'm not quite sure why... It, 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 what the objection is to having it in primary legislation. I mean, I, I accept what she's saying, obviously, about learning uh, um, <coughs> learning lessons from what's happened, and I don't think there's any... There's no problem about someone... Just because someone doesn't want to know, it, it doesn't follow from that that lessons are not going to be learned. So I'm not entirely clear uh, that there is any fundamental objection to what I'm proposing here. So it becomes a judgment about, oh, it's got to be in regulations rather than in primary legislation, and I don't really understand the rationale for that. So I think um, I'm quite happy to uh, withdraw it currently, but at, at the present moment I would be minded to uh, reintroduce it at stage three and perhaps build something in about ensuring that the lessons are learned just to cover that particular concern. But I, I certainly... I don't, I, don't, I don't see any reason why it should not be in primary legislation rather than in, uh, than in, in regulations, but I'm, I'm certainly happy to withdraw today, but certainly would be minded to reintroduce it, um, perhaps in a modified or extended form, at stage three. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm Chisholm is seeking to withdraw Amendment 17. Uh, does any other, any other member object? No, no member object to Amendment uh, number 17. Um, uh, as, as withdrawing. Um, the question now is we call Amendment 12 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 11. Rhoda Grant, to move or not move? Not move. Uh, does any other member wish to move the amendment? No. Um, right. Move to question that section 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes. Thank you. Question is that sections 23 and 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes. Thanks. Uh, I now call Amendment 6 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 7, 8, 5, 9 and 10. Minister, to move amendment, speak, uh, uh, amendment 6 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. These amendments in my name make changes to the interpretation section of Part 2 of the Bill. Amendment 6 has the aim of assisting with the interpretation of provide. It adds a definition of provide to clarify that providing a health service, a care service or a social work service means carrying on or managing such a service. The term provide in relation to care services is already defined in other legislation in a similar way. It is helpful to define it in the Bill so it is clear that the term operates in the same way here. Amendments 7 and 8 relate to the care inspectors' written evidence to the committee at Stage 1 where they raised concerns that care service providers may choose to opt for a different business model, for example trading as an individual but employing others in order to avoid the duty of candour. Amendments 7 and 8 will ensure that in respect of care services Self-employed individuals who employ others or have arrangements with others where those others are directly involved in providing care will be brought within the definition of responsible person in the Bill and therefore would be subject to the duty of candour. Amendment 5 is a technical amendment to correct the name of the Act referred to in Section 25 uh, of the Bill. Amendments 9 and 10 will amend the bill to give Scottish ministers the power to modify the definition of responsible person in section 25.1 of the bill. This will ensure that in the event of the definitions given in section 25 do not cover a particular type of arrangement where it is envisaged that type should be 
subject to the duty of candour. Secondly, secondary legislation can be laid to address this. Equally, the power will also enable Scottish ministers to exempt persons from the definition of a responsible person. Amendment 10 has the effect of making the power conferred by Amendment 9 subject to the affirmative procedure, which we consider to be appropriate <coughs> given that it is a power to amend primary legislation. For the reasons I have outlined, I would ask the Committee to accept these amendments and I move Amendment 6. Thank you. Any members? No? Minister, I don't suppose you wish to make any other further comments. Uh, the question is then, Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I now call Amendments 7, 8, 5 and 9, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 7, 8, 5 and 9 on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Um, does uh, any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 7, 8, 5 and 9? No, thank you. Um, the question is that Amendments 7, 8, 5 and 9 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I now call Amendment 18 in the name of Mary Scanlon, grouped with Amendments 21, 22, 23 and 25. Mary Scanlon to move Amendment 18 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I am very grateful for the Committee's time uh, to consider these amendments. and I would also like to put on record uh, my thanks to the clerks for assisting me with the amendments. Uh, over the years as an MSP, I have met many families, uh, families who are left with the guilt that they should have done more to protect their parents when they were in residential care. Uh, I spoke to one such lady last night, which is the real reason I'm here, and she's given me permission. Sorry. To use, uh, it's quite an emotive issue. Um, to use her name and her mother's name. Uh, her name is Mrs. Blan Bremner, and her mother was Mrs. Doreen McIntyre, who died in a care home in Inverness. Uh, Rhoda Grant will be familiar with it, Kings Mills Care Home some time ago. The family were concerned about the care and treatment of their mother and decided to install a tape recorder in her room. They were shocked when they played it back and I read it and that's why I find it so upsetting. Uh, the Highland Senior Citizens uh, uh, Network, Dr Ian McNamara, quotes, having listened to the tapes, no one could be in any doubt that abuse of an older, vulnerable adult had taken place. I appreciate time's limited, convener, so I will be as brief as possible. Police Scotland were given the tape, and they confirmed, and I quote, staff were behaving in an unprofessional manner and making inappropriate comments. They stated that insulting comments were made by care staff. They were highly inappropriate, derogatory, insensitive, and fell significantly below the standards any reasonable person would expect for the care of a relative. But... It did, they did not reach the threshold set by case law to proceed with a criminal investigation. Had the family installed a CCTV camera and convener, it would have been very different. But I'll just give you an example. When the lady asked for a hand, uh, she kindly asked for a hand to help her. They gave her a round of applause and they laughed and ridiculed her. The police stated there was no evidence of assault by care staff and no evidence to meet the threshold for cruel treatment, which they stated is essentially a serious willful neglect offence. The police stated that the evidenced conduct of care, uh, conduct of care staff at the Four Seasons Care Home required investigation by the relevant agency. The family went to the care inspectorate, who responded to say they, don't, they do not investigate alleged abuse. They went to social work and the social care manager told the family, you have to move on from this issue because legally nothing can be done and it will affect your health. The family are finding it more difficult to move on than the social work appreciated. The care home response was to send a letter that the two members of staff were suspended and no longer employed and that the Four Seasons Care 
bears no admission of guilt as a consequence. I'll come back to this in my next set of amendments. So when I told the family of this legislation convener, I thought it was an opportunity to look at you know, what could be done. The legislation relating to willful neglect, I'm afraid they weren't too impressed, and they pointed out the difference between neglect and abuse. Neglect is to pay little or no attention and to fail to care for or attend to properly. On the other hand, abuse is to hurt or injure by maltreatment, to assail with insulting or hurtful words, to use insulting or hurtful language and to speak insultingly or cruelly. Abuse, in my view, convener, clearly describes the experience at this care home. And it's not the first care home in Scotland where we've heard about this type of abuse. So in my book, many of the problems arising from poor care standards is not simply neglect. It is abuse. And I bring these amendments today to seek clarity around this issue, given that this is a unique opportunity to put something in place to help protect elderly, frail and vulnerable people in Scotland. Um, so I move the amendments. Thank okay. you, Convener. Any other members? Dennis? Oh. Very, very briefly, Convener, and uh, I, I thank Mary Scanlon for bringing this forward. Um, uh, my, my thinking is that there is professional conduct um, already uh, with people who are registered to provide care, and if they fail to do so, you know, they, they can be held responsible. Uh, and indeed, you know, people can uh, have criminal charges brought against them, but certainly an organisation, whether it be social work, social care, uh, in terms of their professional conduct and within their registration, um, these matters are usually dealt with. Uh, and I'm not sure that introducing uh, this amendment through legislation is actually going to uh, assist in, in, in taking that forward um, any more than the professional conduct that is within the registration that, that exists. In response to that, I mean, I don't think anyone listening to Mary couldn't help but be horrified about that experience. And sadly, it is all too common, I think, in some care homes. Um, and we've seen care homes being having their licence removed because of it. I think um, if I was the, 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 the daughter of, of, of that person, I wouldn't be happy if all that could happen to them was to have their professional registration removed. I think um, such abuse really does need a legal sanction. Um, so I would be minded to support Mary Scanlon's amendments. Richard Lyle. Thank you, Gindira. Can I uh, talk to the points that Mary Scanlon has made? I, you know, I, I would be concerned if any that happened in any care home, but can I also place on record that uh, there are many many, many care workers out there, many care homes who deliver an excellent service. I remember uh, a particular care home that my father-in-law was in and it wasn't a five-star hotel, he said he was in, he was in a seven-star hotel. So whilst I take the point that there may be situations which are deplorable and should be uh, uh, um, certainly uh, put to, to law, uh, I have to place on record that there are many care workers in this country who are delivering an excellent service and working very hard to help elderly people. No other members. Nanette Millen. I mean, I hear what Richard Lyle says, and of course we would all agree with that, that there is excellent care in many places, but nonetheless there are cases like Mary Scanlon has just told us, and I remember Mary telling me about this some months ago, and it really is an appalling uh, thing, and I, I think the, the, the law should be able to provide for this uh, form of abuse, in addition to willful neglect and the, the other parts of it. So I would Minister. Support it. Um, thank you, convener. <clears throat> The care worker and care provider offences in part three of the bill are committed where there is ill treatment or willful, willful neglect of individuals in receipt of care. The expressions ill treatment and willful neglect are already, as the committee knows, established in law and cover a wide range of harmful behaviours, including what we would understand by the term abuse. As has been made, made clear previously, these offences are intended to deal with, among other things, 
the sorts of abuses that occurred during the breakdown of care at Mid Staffordshire hospitals. On that basis, adding abuse would not broaden the range of behaviours covered by the offences, as we are content that such behaviour would already be caught by the, t by the bill. The term ill-treatment is distinct from neglect and covers a range of behaviours, including behaviour such as des that described um, so graphically by Mary Scanlon. Additionally, these amendments would mean a departure from the wording of existing offences in relation to those receiving mental health care and treatment and in relation to adults with incapacity. This has the potential to cause confusion and cast doubt over the width of those existing offences. Throughout the government's processes of consultation and engagement on these provisions, there have been many comments on the wording of the offences, and we have sought to reassure stakeholders that the terms ill-treatment and willful neglect are familiar to the Police and Prosecution Service. For these reasons, I'd ask Mary Scanlon to withdraw Amendment 18 and not to move the other amendments. Thank you. Mary Scanlon to wind up press or Yes, uh, thank you, Convener. Can I just say, in coming to the next set of amendments, I appreciate Dennis's point and uh, the Scottish Social Services Council, obviously these care workers would be registered. Um, can I say that uh, one of them is still, up until a few weeks ago, working in the health service, in the National Health Service at Rakemore Hospital in Inverness. So, uh, the example I gave was that they were suspended, they left, there was no investigation, the police could do nothing, care inspector could do nothing and social work could do nothing. Um, Rhoda, and Rhoda's absolutely right, there's been quite a few examples in and around Inverness and uh, uh, it is all too common. Um, can I just say Richard Lyle, and I should have said that at the point, I was so focused on this issue, but two, three or 20 poor care workers doesn't take away from the commitment that 99% of our care workers have. And they're not always the best paid, Richard, either. So I should have put that on the record. And like yourself, I have nothing but respect for well-managed, excellent care homes. And thankfully, most of them are well-managed with excellent staff. So I hope I didn't give the impression by using this example that it was every care home, but I totally and wholeheartedly agree with the points that you made, and uh, I couldn't speak highly enough uh, uh, about uh, what Richard's saying. Um, the Minister, um, because I'm a bit of an outsider here today, uh, convener, uh, I, I'm not um, uh, au fait with all aspects of ill treatment, etc., in the bill. I actually... I, I'm not sure the bill goes far enough, but having said that, I am grateful for the response of the committee. I'm grateful for the response of the minister. I do feel that these amendments needed probing. I think there are many people out there who are saying, how much better is this going to be? Will it ensure that people who do not have the commitment to caring that we would expect that they will not be in charge of my family. So I think having heard what I've uh, heard today, convener, I will not move the amendments, but I may consider submitting them again at stage three. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mary Scanlon is seeking with to withdraw Amendment 18. Does any member object? No, no member objected. Uh, amendment 18 is withdrawn. Thank you. Uh, I now call Amendment 19 in the name of Mary Scanlon, grouped with Amendments 20, 24 and 26. Mary Scanlon to move Amendment 19 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. And this probably follows on from the very good point that Dennis Robertson made um, about you know, the professional conduct uh, and what happens. Uh, I have described the very poor experience of care standards and, of course, the tape-recorded evidence only related to two care staff. Uh, as I said, were a camera installed in the room, obviously the evidence would be so much clearer and the court case and prosecution would be so much different. But given that the staff were suspended and no longer employed by Four Seasons Homes, they were instantly able to gain employment elsewhere in the care sector, and particularly given that we have a national shortage of uh, care worker staff. 
One of the care workers got work at Rakemore Hospital, working for NHS Highland, although the family have raised this with the NHS, and I'm not sure that he's still employed there. Uh, but it was highlighted by the family, and I also brought it to the attention of NHS Highland. But it was the ease of further employment allowing opportunities to continue his unacceptable practices, which angered and continues to anger this family. So my amendments today look at what can be done to protect others from care workers who do not live up to their job description. This is particularly relevant in this case as well uh, as when a prosecution has been successful. So uh, I, I'm just looking at if someone... It was very difficult in this place. There was tape-recorded evidence. Um, the police said it was inappropriate, etc. There were no charges. There was no investigation. No one picked it up. The care workers just walked away and got jobs elsewhere. So, again, convener approving amendments. OK. Any other members? No other members. Minister. Uh, thank you, convener. Amendments 19 and 24 in Mary Scanlon's name which remove the option of ill-treatment and willful neglect offences being tried under summary procedure would most likely result in fewer cases of neglect or ill-treatment making it to court as the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service would only proceed with the most serious cases of ill-treatment or neglect where solemn procedure would be appropriate. For the existing offences of willful neglect and ill-treatment in mental health and adults with incapacity legislation Nearly 80% of the prosecutions so far have been under summary procedure. Removing the option of summary procedure would severely limit the discretion of the Procurator Fiscal in dealing with less serious cases. Amendments 20 and 26 require Scottish Ministers to make regulations preventing convicted care workers from working in care roles. I thank Mary Scanlon for giving me the opportunity to set out my intention to bring forward amendments at stage three that relate to this issue. First of all, to set out the background, there is already protection, sorry, there is already provision in the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 27 that requires employers and regulators to refer individuals to Disclosure Scotland for the purposes of considering them for listing as unsuitable to do regulated work where they have harmed a protected adult. In addition, and more specifically, in relation to the offences in Part 3 of this Bill, a court may, when convicting, refer a convicted individual to Disclosure Scotland where the court thinks it may be appropriate for that individu individual to be considered for, listening, for listing. Disclosure Scotland will then give consideration as to whether the individual should be listed as unsuitable to work with vulnerable adults. In terms of standard and enhanced disclosures under the Police Scotland 1997 and the PVG scheme record disclosures under the 27 Act, a conviction for ill treatment or willful neglect under Part 3 of this Bill would be disclosed to a prospective employer. And indeed, given the seriousness of these offences, I intend to bring forward amendments at Stage 3 so that these offences will continue to be disclosed even when they would otherwise be spent convictions because of the passage of time. I am therefore satisfied that there are sufficient safeguards in place to ensure that unsuitable people would not be employed as care workers. So for these reasons, I would ask Mary Scanlon to withdraw Amendment 19 and not to move Amendments 20, 24 and 26. Mary Scanlon to uh, wind up, press of withdrawal. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I would be concerned, obviously, if fewer cases were getting to court, because uh, uh, that's certainly not uh, not something that I would have intended. But can I just say, Convener, that uh, I'm delighted with the, the tone and the response from the Minister, because I was hoping to get a good hearing today. I think this is an area that we are all concerned about, and uh, the fact that uh, the Minister is bringing forward amendments at Stage 3, the fact that she's giving this part of the Bill further consideration. Can I just say I'm very grateful uh, for her response, so I'll be withdrawing the first amendment and not moving the rest of them. Thank you. OK. Um, uh, Mary Scanlon is seeking to uh, withdraw Amendment 19. 
Uh, does any member object? No. No member has objected to um, uh, Amendment 19 being withdrawn. The way that uh, it is withdrawn. Um, we now call Amendment 20 in the name of Mary Scanlon, already debated with Amendment 19. Mary Scanlon to move or not move? No. Not move. Um, does any other member wish to, to move the amendment? Um, uh, that uh, we just move to the next amendment. Then. The question is that section 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I now call Amendment 21 in the name of Mary Scanlon, already debated with Amendment 18. Mary Scanlon, to move or not move? Not move. Sorry. Uh, uh, no other Sorry member wishing to move the amendment? I've no. got another committee. Okay. Um, we call Amendment 22 in the name of Mary Scanlon, already debated with Amendment 18. Mary Scanlon, to move or not move? Not move. Uh, members not move. Any other member wish to move? No. no. Uh, we call Amendment 23 in the name of Mary Scanlon, already debated with Amendment 18. Mary Scanlon, to move or not move? Not move. Mary Scanlon is not moving. Any other member wish to move the amendment? No. I now call Amendment 24 in the name of Mary Scanlon, already debated with Amendment 19. Mary Scanlon, to move or not move? Not move. Member is not moving. Any other member wish to move? No. No. The question is then that Section 20. Seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, convener. The question is that section the call amendment, Mary. Um, <laughs> the question is that section twenty eight be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, now call amendment twenty five uh, in the name of Mary Scanlon. Already debated with amendment eighteen. Mary Scanlon, to move or not move? Not move. Mary Scanlon's not moving. Any other member wish to move the amendment? No. It isn't. The question then is that section 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. question is that sections 30 and 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to suspend at, the, suspend at this point um, um, and uh, welcome you officials to, uh, to join the minister. Okay? Thank you very much for those who attend. Uh, we we continue with this uh, session, and I uh, welcome you officials to, who are now uh, uh, accompanying the minister, Angela Bonamy, Sensory Impairment National Delivery Support Advisor. 
David Wilson, Legal Directorate, and uh, Meryl Skeen, the Parliamentary Counsel from the Scottish Government's Health Bill team. Welcome to you all. And I now move to call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister and the group on its own Minister to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Convener, and I'll speak to Amendment 1 in my name. The Scottish Government recognises that provision of communication equipment and the associated support required to use that equipment are key requirements of children and adults who have lost their voice or have difficulty speaking. Communication equipment can range from low-tech, uh, for example, picture symbol books, to high-tech, such as dedicated voice output aids. Individuals who use communication equipment, service providers and organisations representing service users tell us that provision across Scotland is inconsistent, inequitable and does not always meet the needs of people with communication difficulties, particularly those requiring high-tech devices. The majority of them told us in response to a call for written evidence that they support the need for the legislation we are discussing today. The aim of Amendment 1 is to provide a more explicit duty on Scottish ministers to provide or secure the provision of communication equipment and its associated support, which will consequently raise the profile of this service, bringing it to the forefront of service delivery. By introducing this duty, it is expected that health boards who will dis discharge that duty on behalf of Scottish ministers will review their current service, systems and processes and consider this service as a priority. The breadth of the proposed duty is deliberate. It provides flexibility to, to determine who might receive communication equipment, what type of equipment might be provided, and allows responsiveness to future technological developments. In addition, under the existing powers of the 1978 Act, Scottish Ministers will issue directions to health boards in the near future to help support the discharge of this duty. These directions will need to be carefully considered. They must contain the correct level of detail to address the operational issues and deliver person-centred care. We know that this is a cause for concern amongst a number of our stakeholders and we thank them for bringing these to our attention. The directions will be developed in consultation with stakeholders. Discussions are underway, underway with the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists to develop a Scottish Government funded programme of operational improvement work. This will build on the recent Right to Speak strategy and lay strong foundations for the introduction of directions. I would also like to highlight the ongoing work around voice banking an important development in augment augmentative and alternative communication. The Scottish Government will fund the Ewan Macdonald Centre to pilot voice banking in three NHS sites from April of this year. And we thank Gordon Aikman for bringing this research work to our attention and look forward to the findings of the pilot. The financial implications of this duty are expected to be cost neutral as it will not lead to an increase in demand but any future directions are likely to incur modest financial costs for health boards and local authorities. To be clear, the more immediate operational improvement work with the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists and the Voice Banking Pilot are both being funded by the Scottish Government. Convener, loss, loss of voice and the need for voice equipment affects a small number of people but has a huge impact on their lives. Imagine if we in this room had difficulty communicating and could not convey our message. I therefore feel that legislating is the right thing to do and know that a number of people agree. So I move Amendment 1 in my name. Thank you. Any members? Annette Millen, Dennis Robertson and then Rhoda Grant. Annette. Yes, I, I mean, I'm, I, I think the, the principle of this amendment is, is excellent, the provision of the communication equipment and the support uh, required. I'm, I'm glad to hear what the Minister said about guidance to health boards because I, I was quite concerned when I saw the number of suggested amendments coming in from the College of Speech and Language Therapists in, in response to, to the Minister's amendment. Um, so I, hopefully that's been taken care of. Another issue which was raised quite a bit that uh, concerns me a bit is about, about funding. 
I think I can't find it on the iPad, but Cosler put in a, a fairly late submission, um, and we're really quite concerned that, that there would be enough funding um, for the likely to cope with the likely demand for this sort of equipment. And I was wondering if something that's something that could be looked at in, in detail. I mean, the principle of the amendment I'm, I'm very happy with, but I think there may be some detail to be sorted out, which presumably could be done uh, later on in regulation or guidance. Dennis okay. Robertson. Thank you, convener. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, in taking forward this amendment, Minister, does this, would this um, remove uh, the duty on the Department of Work and Pensions through access to work for the provision of uh, similar equipment? I mean, I personally rely on communication equipment all the time, uh, and it's, although I have my own voice, a, I rely on speech a, uh, activated equipment all the time. And I'm just wondering, in taking this forward, would this remove the requirement on DWP to uh, a, provide such equipment for people in work? Um, can, I welcome, can I welcome the am amendment? Um, I think it's really important, and I think when people are faced with a devastating illness that they know that they're going to lose their voice and not be able to communicate properly to have something that they can hold as as comfort to them and 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 take some proactive action to 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 put or or to put in some mitigation of that i think is really important i'm glad this amendment is here and I, i'm glad also that the minister paid tribute to Gordon Aikman, who has brought this to very much to the fore and probably given an awful lot of other people who wouldn't have had this assistance access to it because I think, certainly speaking for myself, things like voice banking was something I was totally unaware of until that point. So I'm um, grateful to him and grateful to the Minister for bringing it forward. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I, I think in uh, reply to uh, Nanette Milne, um, we've taken um, the view that um, less is more in terms of um, what we put into uh, the face of the bill rather than being so prescriptive about things because technology moves on. We don't know whether in a couple of years there may be something um, that technology has moved and replaces voice banking, for example. So we didn't want to uh, restrict ourselves in terms of that. In terms of... Uh, the DWP, uh, Mr Robertson, uh, the answer to your question is no. It wouldn't relieve the duty on the DWP. Um, they are complementary uh, duties. And in terms um, of funding um, and local authorities, I mean, the funding um, is the Scottish Government through uh, the health boards, um, but that will obviously, the way that's worked out, will be addressed as we develop um, the direction uh, of travel with the legislation. Okay. A uh, question is then that um, Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with amen Amendment 6. Minister, to move forward. Moved. Thank you. Question is then that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 26 in the name of Mary Scanlon, already debated with Amendment 19. Mary Scanlon, to move or not move? Not move. The, the member wishes, uh, does, not, uh, does, not, does not wish to move the amendment. Does any other member wish to move the amendment? Okay. Um, we go now to the question that Section 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Question is that sections 33 to 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Question is that the long title be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That, uh, that, that ends stage two consideration of the bill. Thank you, Minister, and your colleagues that were with you this morning. We now um, suspend it. Uh, we will we'll move to the agenda. Well, just let this clear the room a wee bit, maybe just pause.
agenda item number five. Um, uh, we have two negative instruments before us today. The first instrument is Public Bodies Joint Working Integrating Joint Board Establishment Scotland Amendment Order 2016 SSI 2016-2. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers uh, and Law Reform Committee have not made any um, comments on the instrument. Uh, do you have any comments from members? Um, has the committee therefore agreed to make no recommendation? Thank you. The second instrument before us is the Health Board's Membership and Procedure Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016 SSI. 2016 3. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has, have not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, do the committee members have any comments? They uh, have not had any comments. Has the committee therefore agreed to make no recommendations? Okay. That's agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number six, uh, which is palliative care. Um, we are we are just ahead of schedule, and I think the Cabinet Secretary may have some uh, travel problems. So we can suspend at this point, get a coffee, stretch your legs or whatever, and, uh, but don't go far. So we can proceed um, uh, uh, quickly to our business when the Cabinet Secretary arrives. Thank you all.
we <coughs> we now move to our sixth item on the agenda, which is an evidence session on the Scottish Government's strategic framework on palliative care uh, and its response to the committee's report on palliative care. Um, you know, so I welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary and the officials here this, the, this morning, Shona Robertson, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, welcome. Janice Birrell, uh, Senior Policy Implementation Manager, and Craig White, Divisional Clinical Lead Chair, National Advisory Group for Palliative and End of Life Care, all from the Scottish Government. Welcome to you, to you all. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I was remiss the last time in giving you an opportunity to make some uh, opening remarks, and you have that opportunity on this issue today before we move to, to questions. Thanks very much, uh, Convener, for giving me the opportunity to discuss what's a, a very important issue of palliative and end-of-life care. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I very much welcome the committee's report. We need to talk about palliative care. It's a, an important time for <coughs> palliative and end-of-life care in Scotland, a time um, when we've seen uh, unprecedented public discussion about end-of-life issues um, and um, I think a conversation really on which we need to build. I was um, particularly struck by the comprehensive way in which the committee assembled the, the evidence and were informed by the oral evidence presented uh, to you. I'd also like to commend the committee for taking the opportunity to meet with service users during the visits to Rachel House and Ardgowan Hospice. I firmly believe that as part of delivering person-centred health and social care, that it's vital that we listen and learn from people who are using services. And with more and more adults in Scotland living with long-term conditions involving specific palliative care needs and, of course, children with life-shortening conditions living into adulthood, I fully recognise the need for robust and effective action to address changing needs. On the 18th of December last year, I had the, the privilege of launching the Scottish Government's strategic framework for action on palliative and end-of-life care at the Marie Curie Hospice in Edinburgh. And I was deeply grateful for the opportunity to speak with patients and staff there to hear directly about their individual experiences. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to pay tribute to the hard work of all the, the charities, members of the public, representatives of the health and social care sectors and the many others who help to develop the framework. I'm extremely pleased to be able to tell the committee that the strategic framework has received a, a positive response from around the world, with positive recognition coming from members of the World Health Organization and the uh, um, Alterum, Alterum Institute in the United States. The vision set out in the framework is that by 2021, everyone in Scotland will have access to good quality palliative and end-of-life care, which is tailored to their own symptoms and life circumstances. And we're committed to ensuring that people can access high-quality palliative and end-of-life care, regardless of their age, diagnosis, socioeconomic background or where they live. The new health and social care partnerships and the independent hospice care and voluntary sectors will have a central role in local areas across Scotland in meeting the growing and changing need that I referred to earlier. Only by focusing on local capacity and local solutions can we ensure that we deliver the best care and support for all those at the end of life and for their families and carers. I recognise that significant improvements have been made in the delivery of palliative and end of life care in recent years. The committee heard about these from Professor David Clark from the University of Glasgow, who is a world leading authority on this subject. Scotland already has a, a good reputation for our palliative and end-of-life care. Indeed, there has been an increase in the number of doctors and nurses working in spe specialist palliative care services in Scotland. I fully understand, however, that there's still a great deal that we can do to improve the provision of palliative and end-of-life care. And I recognise that that's not going to be an easy task and will require a great deal of hard work and commitment of many individuals and organisations across health and social care, the independent ho hospice and care sector and voluntary sector. The framework outlines the Scottish Government's 10 commitments for action to support effective implementation over the next five years. We've also committed £3.5 million to support national improvements and to build capacity. The 10 commitments within the framework provide a, a clear direction for future improvement. 
These commitments are designed to improve palliative and end-of-life care in ways that are sustainable and can be applied in many settings. Training and education is a key priority uh, that we've already identified for targeted action. And we've got to ensure that medical, nursing and care staff are supported to recognise when time is becoming short and when sensitive conversations with people and their loved ones can make an enormous difference. I'm happy to report that work on fulfilling this commitment has already begun. NHS Education Scotland are in the process of recruiting three regional practice education coordinators to work across the NHS and social care services to establish an integrated and collaborative approach to palliative and end-of-life care education provision across uh, health and social care partnerships. And finally, you know, we agree with the committee's findings that there's a need to improve the information we have, and that's why we've committed to improvements in the way information is recorded, shared and accessed ac across the sectors. That will include capturing end-of-life uh, care preferences on where people would like to be cared for when, the, when time becomes short. It's recognised that these preferences may change and um, what it might be possible to provide will also change de dependent on someone's clinical condition. However, we need to be better in anticipating and recording care needs and to having that open discussion with people about what matters most to them. It will be important that staff across sectors are supported to improve the delivery of palliative and end-of-life care. And, of course, that as part of the strategic framework, we'll also support clinical and cost-effectiveness evaluations. And a review of hospice funding is being planned as part of the implementation process. Um, I hope that's uh, been a, a, a run-through of some of the, the key uh, elements of our response. And I'm very happy at this stage, convener, to answer any questions that, that members may have. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, our first question to, uh, from a committee member is Nanette Millen. Good morning. Um, I'm delighted to, I was delighted with the government's response actually to the Health Committee report because I think a, a lot of work went into that and it, it's good that there's mutual thinking um, uh, along these lines. Um, I'm actually quite sorry that I won't be in Parliament to see this, <laughs> the progress of, of this. There will be a lot of work ahead. Um, I'd, I'd like to maybe pursue the, the, the conversations because at various meetings I've been at over the last couple of years and from witnesses and so on, it's the fact that we, we still don't talk as a country, we don't talk about death, we don't talk about planning for death and about uh, end of life care, palliative care and what I think I found concerning with Marie Curie first, first raised it with me was the fact that healthcare professionals are not I find it very difficult to, to talk with our patients about that. I can fully understand that. Um, I mean, as a young doctor, we were thrown in at the deep end without any training at all to try and speak to patients about the, the fact they were, they were dying. And it wasn't easy, and we, I'm sure a lot of mistakes were made because we had no training in it. Um, so I, I think it's been very, very important to try and change the culture around that and, and early so that once someone is diagnosed with a terminal condition, that they, they do um, have the, really the forward plan. Uh, openly and freely discussed with healthcare professionals. So it really was just around that. And uh, if, if you could give me any more detail that, of what the, the framework would do to sort of drive this new culture uh, of openness um, within the community. Yep. I mean, I think part of it is obviously the training and support for, for health and care professionals, and that's obviously a key part of the framework. But the wider conversation about how as a society we deal with these issues is, is the more challenging one. As a society, I think we have found it difficult, perhaps a bit easier now than maybe um, a decade or a couple of decades ago, but nevertheless, still very challenging. And of course, that's why we've been um, looking at the extending the, the voices survey to, to Scotland wide um, to be able to use um, opportunities like that, working with you know, the Alliance and Scottish Health Council and others to really begin to um, keep that conversation going in the public arena about um, end of life and palliative care and, um, and dying generally and the fact that people should be able to express their preferences and that that's something to encourage within the, the, the for the family to talk about none of that is easy and when it comes to you as an individual having that conversation it's it's the theory is one thing the practice is another and I think that support 
for particularly for perhaps newly qualified staff. I think it's going to be very important. And just finally, I'll let Craig come in, but the anticipatory care planning, I think, is, is very important here because it gives a focus for the discussion. If, if there's an anticipatory care plan, there's something then to talk about with the, the person and the family. Um, and I think that, in some ways, can, can make it a lot easier because there's something already there um, as a focal point. Craig, do you want to...? Um, as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, good progress is being made by NHS Education for Scotland and the SSSC. In fact, the interviews for those posts that were mentioned are taking place today. Um, one of the advantages of NHS Education for Scotland and SSSC being involved is because of their existing involvement in the curriculum planning and the, the training across the, the different professions. Um, we're also starting to see, since the framework was developed, some uh, organisations sharing with uh, NES and the SSSC their own local training needs analysis. So, for example, NHS Tayside, uh, just this past week, um, have shared with us um, some surveys that they've been doing of medical and nursing staff, asking them to uh, rate their level of confidence in these issues so that that can inform the needs analysis that the three new post holders will be doing um, across the country. Um, we've also heard in talking to stakeholders that um, initiatives like Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief, which you, your inquiry report referenced, um, are important in designing uh, future approaches around the public conversation, uh, so taking the learning from Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief, um, and scaling that up across the country so that we, we reach more people uh, with, with that, which in turn will mean that when people have to have conversations, uh, they, they'll be less uh, concerned by some of the barriers that, that have been reported. The plan for training and support, is that to start pretty early on, at under, uh, undergraduate level for, say, nurses and doctors, particularly doctors? And I, I accept them once they're in post as well, presumably it has to be an ongoing um, sort of, well, if you call it training or, or call it support, I, I don't know which, but I, I think it has to be introduced, my feeling is it has to be introduced early and then progressed so that they, they, they continue to develop confidence, if you like, in, in raising the issue with people. And, and, er, and early on with, with people, when you, when, when you really can have a decent amount of anticipatory care plan. Yes, absolutely. So, so in both those points, there's the, the early inclusion in the curricula and, the, and particularly in the practice-based aspects of health professions and social care professionals training, but as you say, um, uh, helping people uh, who, who are in the professions to realise that these are conversations that don't just belong at recognition of end of life or deterioration, but, but one wants to have those earlier as part of the care and support planning at work. Leave to that just now. Okay. I, mean, <clears throat> I, th I think it's, uh, you know, that uh, need to talk about this is, um, uh, is very, very, very important. And, and um, I, I thought the Chief Medical Officer's annual report um, was very, very good in, uh, in terms of the challenge that we have here. I suppose, you know, as a committee, we were flagging up education and training, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that will assist in some some ways. Mm -hmm. But what we're dealing with here is a, a, you know, a much deeper problem in the, uh, in, in the professions and in terms of pressure to do something, even mm -hmm. when it will make no difference. And she highlighted some of the, you know, about that. You know, <coughs> if we're talking about palliative care and the end of life, those decisions about whether you take intensive treatments or, or, or having the opportunity to understand the consequences of, of all of that. And that was something the committee touched on yeah. in terms of access to, uh, to new drugs and, uh, um, you know, particularly end of life and, and cancer. And we also picked up, I think, if some of the, the, the people remember about the, the clinician that was at a gown hospital who didn't just deal with cancer, where it seems to be easier to talk about these things because of the inevitability about it and a time scale probably it can be applied. But in terms of respiratory illness, which <laughs> is the same case, that, that having this discussion with people with a respiratory illness, it's not cancer, would be seen as, by the clinician's point of view of abandoning and uh, you know just saying you know sending you home sort of so we're dealing with things here that are, are very uh, uh, you know 
you know, deep set in the in, in the culture of the National Health Service and, you know, education and training and you know, it's all very well, but we need a you know, as a chief medical officer has suggested, we need something more than that. Do 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 you agree? I I I think her report was very good, quite challenging in some ways, yeah. reflecting some of the debates and discussions that are are ongoing and I think it's very we're in a, a different place than we were um, years ago in that palliative care and people can live a long time in a palliative care situation um, and their needs will change um, and their requirements will, will, will change through that time and I think that's probably where the anticipated care plan is so important because the discussion about someone's wishes should happen at a time that's not a, an end of life point, but a time where they're more able to to have that discussion, um, hopefully involving their family about what it is their expectations would be um, uh, through their, their their care pathway that which may may be quite over quite a long period of time, and at the end of that, what their end of life choices should be, and um, and maybe having a focus and more priority given to that um, as well as obviously the, the importance of the, the right whether it's medication or interventions these will all be, always be clinical judgments um, but I suppose part of the debate the chief medical officer sparked off is about is there sometimes a, an over medicalization of somebody's care you know that the then sometimes of course the expectation of of, of families and the person themselves will be if if they hear about a drug or something that that uh, um, you know that that could be a uh, um, enhance their 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 the length of, of of time that they have. Of course, it's a natural instinct for somebody to want to access that, and I think that's where clinicians um, have to have that conversation about you know, what those the expectations would be, what it would do, what the likelihood would be, and you know any side effects, for example, because sometimes there are quite dramatic side effects, and in an end-of-life situation, uh, that might not always be what's in the best interest of the person. Those, these are always very, very difficult discussions, which I think is why they're best had as early as possible uh, in that, that process. Craig, do you want to one of the things that, as a committee, I know you've um, heard evidence from before is the importance of considering this across a wide range of conditions, but, but also is not just something that relates to end of life. Um, the Chief Medical Officer um, actually asked um, for um, some of the clinicians and people who work in clinical lead roles like my, myself and colleagues to um, advise her around some of the themes so we were able to give her advice around some of the, the issues relating to palliative care and your inquiry report um, and it very much informed some of the thinking around the conversation that she wants to have with doctors around realistic medicine um, and how we build on the good work that's already taken place around putting, putting people and families at the centre of conversations about anticipating future care needs but also recognising uh, and it goes back to um, Nanette Milne's point around that that may raise issues around confidence and skills for doctors. Um, so, so linking both of these issues together in the conversation that the Chief Medical Officer um, initiated in our report. She is also highlighting that, that in, intensive care didn't lead to... There is evidence now that intensive care doesn't lead to better outcomes. And she cited some American studies of stage 4 cancer where the, you know, the, those who took intensive care or opted for intensive care and those who took hospice at home had a, 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 a had a better outcome now you know it seemed that we're going to have to have that debate that will support education and training that will that, that will that will encourage people not the clinicians to make that that, that choice but the individual and having that discussion with the individual about the options that they have, not just the new medicine, the intensive treatment, or, 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 or whatever. And you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what I don't know if simply education, the, the education and tearing of the workforce is going to 
is going to help change that dynamic. I mean, ultimately, it will always come down to, to clinical judgment in discussion with the, 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 the patient and their family. I mean, sometimes people will will choose um, um, a different option given you know, the, the, if they're being fully aware of the side effects and what, what to expect, people will sometimes make those choices. And I think it's about having the full range of information about what those options will entail um, and having that discussion at a, a, an early enough stage so that a, a, a proper informed choice uh, can be made. And also, um, you know, the some of the, 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 the practices that we, we still have of of perhaps kind of panic and um, perhaps a, a, a kind of fall down in pain control leading to, you know, a, a, a kind of last minute hospital admission at end of life. There are those very practical issues that need to be overcome to make sure that, you know, at that stage, um, it's, you know, people are able to still have their choice. And if someone has chosen to have their end of life care at home, that that is supported and and sustained um, uh, and you know we, I'm sure the committee as I have have heard of, of cases where that was the act of choice but because um, um, there was a, a, um, a lack of confidence at the end of what, what to expect um, and perhaps issues around pain control that people ended up in a hospital setting um, when they, they, they shouldn't have if we the pathway had been uh, delivered as it should have been um, to, for the sub, for the person to have their end of life care at home. So these are the things we absolutely want to get in and about with the implementation of, you know, how can we ensure that someone's wishes are delivered, um, that the, that there's a confidence there, not just from the professionals but the patient themselves, that they will be supported in their choice, um, and that the families and I can't stress this enough. I think families have got to be involved in this discussion because, you know, in an end of life situation, families can sometimes become understandably um, quite upset and distressed. And you know, we've got to make sure that um, everybody's clear um, about what those choices are. Um, Janice, do you want to? Just in terms of anticipatory care planning, that, that we're already working closely with the, the living well and communities work, and there's a specific strand of work that's linked to anticipatory care planning. And there's been two new appointments made, clinical appointments made to that work that's based within and hosted within Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And in line with just the discussion just now, that there's a wider piece of work looking at emergency care and treatment planning, and we're ensuring that the anticipatory care planning work is, is linked and has an oversight of the wider emergency care and treatment planning that's actually out for consultation just now, and I'm happy to share with the committee the, the hyperlink to that piece of work. So that, that, just, that, that is aiming to take on board you know, at that crisis point um, when... when you know, the, the discussions that have, had, have been had at an earlier stage, um, but there is that emergency care and treatment plan in place. So it, it links very much to the wider anticipatory care planning, but taken on board when, when times become a bit difficult, um, what, what are the care preferences at that point in time? I was trying to focus on the, the implications of some of the decisions you make earlier on before yeah. the emergency situation. So what likelihood is there currently now uh, that that discussion um, will take place, and what, are that, what, 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 what would that discussion look like, at the, uh, you know, or sound like at this uh, at this point? And is there any consistency or guidelines across the board about what that should look like, like or is that simply left to doctor knows best? There is, there is in Lanarkshire, there is a consistent approach across care, the care home setting that's been piloted over recent years, anticipatory care planning. I think all but one care home in the Lanarkshire area use the same anticipatory care plan. And there's actually data that demonstrates that inappropriate admissions to hospital has declined over the time. So there is work ongoing in local areas to fit with the local infrastructure um, to make sure that anticipatory care plan with a, a care lead is identified so in, with, in, in discussion with the families that there is a, a clear plan in place. So the, there is work that we, we, we are trying to spread and share. One of, one of the issues that did come up in the evidence is, uh, is about whether you know, a death at home or closer to home or a residential setting is, 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 
is a, is a better death mm. than in a hospital. We haven't measured that in any sense. Where, although we, we put it forward saying, well, more people are dying at home. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that's better. We do. We, we, do we know about the, the, the quality of that uh, of that death, the impact of that on that individual or the family? I don't think we do. Well, and Craig will say something about this. I suppose that that's been based on people's preferences being delivered. Um, but you're right about then actually looking at the quality of that experience and making sure that um, what we we think is you know, the, the the better solution um given that um you know we know all of the the challenges there are in kind of busy uh, hospital wards in terms of making sure that there's there's privacy and, and dignity although you know that is what is delivered in in most cases but craig do you want to say a bit about the quality of experience yeah so uh, as the committee will know from other sessions it's had around spreading uh, quality improvement initiative safety initiatives we, we have learned through other work such as the scottish patient safety program about the best ways to spread reliable care process to make health care safer and therefore we've looked at some of the learning from that around how for example we take the work that janice uh, mentioned in NHS Lanarkshire and we through um, support that we will give to health and social care partnerships how they can um, uh, test and implement that within their local systems and that will reduce the variation um, in, in relation to when and how the conversations take place. You're absolutely right. We then want to be able to measure that and, and your inquiry report, as you know, identified that there is um, a, an urgent need to look at measurement um, and describing the, the quality of care. Um, we've been um, supporting some work in NHS Lothian around how to ask people um, about their experience of care, um, how to use the voices framework that was mentioned to ask uh, bereaved relatives for their reflection on the quality of care but importantly as opposed to waiting for a survey once every year or two years we're looking at how that data can be made available um, again learning from the safety work uh, to teams um, every day every week um, mm -hmm. so that they can continuously improve the, the quality of care um, so there is still variation but uh, as the cabinet secretary said uh, we want to try and uh, accelerate that the, the, the the progress around uh, consistency of care process so that um, in keeping with the vision by 2021 that everybody irrespective of condition will will know uh, when and how and with whom those sorts of conversations are going to take place. And as Robertson wants a supplementary and then take Rhoda Grant. Hey, thank you very much. It, it's really on the conversation. Um, just now, uh, when we heard the evidence, uh, I believe it was from Dr David Carroll from NHS Grampian, he said that Having the conversation is fine, but you need to continue that conversation because patients uh, and indeed sometimes families uh, may, may well change their mind in terms of the type of care that they, they wish or indeed where they wish to maybe end their life. Uh, so it, it, this probably brings me to the, the, the HIS. Um, in your response, you, you, you suggest that they're looking at their methodology um, of how they inspect um, uh, what's going on at the moment. Do you anticipate a time frame for that? Um, I'll let Craig answer on the time frame. The, you're right, though, about the, you know a, a plan, an anticipated care plan, isn't something that's done once and then that's it frozen in time because people's needs will change, um, and that may lead them to a, a different conclusion about what they, they want for um, their care and in, including end of life care. Uh, so that has to be an ongoing um, conversation and it has to be coordinated so everybody is, is clear about those, those wishes. Um, Craig, in terms of uh, the time frame, do you want? Um, so in, 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 I think you might be... Yeah, so, so I, th I think there are probably th three three elements to that. Um, first is in, in relation to um, our commitment to um, support Healthcare Improvement Scotland and others with the work it, it's going to do around 
uh, the, the, the commitments and in, in improving the, the quality of uh, palliative and end-of-life care. Um, Janice and I met with uh, representatives of Healthcare Improvement Scotland last week, but also uh, Scottish Care, the Care Inspectorate, and the two new clinicians that have been appointed to lead some of the um, anticipatory care planning work. So timescale-wise, that, that work is, is underway. Um, we, we've asked them to submit a report describing how their existing work um, can support the, the commitments to palliative and end-of-life care, but importantly also link with other work that's ongoing, such as the National Care Standards uh, work, um, and also the inspection process for strategic uh, plans for health and social care partnerships, which his and the Care Inspectorate are working on. So, so it, it's, very, it's happening at, at the moment, and, and we're linking this with our ongoing mechanisms to review um, uh, the, the, the outcomes from this work. Uh, the guidance that health boards have been given for the local delivery plans. Again, we've we've um, invited them to submit details around how the strategic framework um, is going to be implemented. So, so we've tried very much to link this with all the existing programmes of work and the annual monitoring uh, and governance mechanisms within the boards and within the partnerships. Rhoda Grant. Can I just ask a quick supplementary on that, on that as well? Just the difference between kind of hospital and community palliative care, especially in an emergency situation, which we didn't really take an awful lot of evidence on. But it seems to me that it's a different setup. Something happens very quickly. Um, there's a huge intervention, and then people realise, staff realise that they can't really help somebody. There needs to be a different kind of palliative care there, especially for families who are kind of willing this person to, you know, this person was hale and hearty, you know, half an hour ago and then suddenly. Um, has any thought been given to how that happens, especially in a really busy, say, ITU emergency department or something like that? Yes. Um, I mean, interestingly, I, I just uh, recently was um, inquiring around uh, what happens in an emergency department. And uh, I was in the emergency A and E department at Nine Wells a few months ago and, and saw for myself that even in a, a busy A and E department there's good practice around ensuring that there's um a quiet area and for um where there can be dignity and, and, and peace at end, end of life, which you know can imagine is a is quite challenging but the um the, the boards are um have assured me that they make arrangements even within a busy a &E department where it, to move the person somewhere else would be um, stressful to the patient and their families and therefore obviously it's not uh, where that, that you would want someone to, to have um, end of life care but if the clinical judgment is it would be um, better than moving someone at that stage very, very much at the end of, of life, then there is a, a, a good guidance around how that's done in a dignified manner. And uh, you know, as I say, I saw for myself in, in Nine Wells how that's done. Um, sorry. It's just in terms of um, the commissioning guidance, one of our commitments is to provide health and social care partnerships with guidance around commissioning. And uh, as the committee may be aware, the partnerships will be responsible for commissioning palliative care in hospitals as well as in community settings. And um, so we will be making sure that some of the issues the Cabinet Secretary mentioned are um, clearly reflected in that guidance um, in order that the people who present uh, to accident and emergency <coughs> departments um, have high quality palliative and end of life care. Um, the work around transforming urgent care that, as you know, Sir Lewis Ritchie was leading is also relevant to this. And um, Sir Lewis and I are meeting later today in order to discuss the issue you've raised to, to make sure that some of that work um, can be informed when people present to urgent care services and when there's a need to look at the most appropriate uh, care setting. Okay, can I move on to um, a substantive question, um, which is about children. Um, I visited Rachel House as part of the committee inquiry and it struck me that palliative care for children is quite different to palliative care for adults because you're quite often dealing um, with with children from from very small babies who have life limiting conditions who might not see adulthood um, so I was wondering if definitions would be different for them and then 
kind of looking further ahead as care gets better, as people learn more about those conditions. Some of those children live into adulthood and there seems to be a gap. Now, I notice um, fr from your report you're talking about um, ages 0 to 25, but in some cases that can be up into 30s um, and where families have depended on children's hospice services, which gives them huge support. Sometimes they feel a bit um, cast out, I guess, after that because um, the, the kind of adult support for life limiting conditions is not is not of the same, not even on the same Richter scale, to be honest. Recognition and certainly recognition in our response that um, you know the, the the needs of of um, children and young people um, uh, can d be very different from those of adults. And you, know, you you touched on something quite important that actually the um, many children and young people through the development of um, medication technology, new um, uh, ways of uh, of supporting children young people with uh, life-limiting illnesses are now living for, for much longer, thankfully, than was previously the case. And what we need to make sure is that um, things like transition period from uh, children to adult services is is, um, is as smooth as it possibly can be, um, and that the, the needs of, of children and young people are quite distinct. And I think that's hopefully recognised in our response and comes through in our response. Um, Craig, do you want to add a little bit on the... There was a question about def definitions and... Yes, yeah, so... Um, or do you want to... Yeah. I think within so the, the um, wider evidence summary, there is the, the definitions... Are, there is a, a specific definition for, for children uh, and young adults. But in, in, in terms of the uh, work that we've been doing with CHAS and officials have met... I've been at a number of meetings where we've met with the transitions team that are, has been appointed to CHAS and they are currently uh, testing out different models of particularly respite care for a number of young adults who are used to coming together and meeting within CHAS and going forward as how best might they be supported. But in recognition that one size doesn't fit all, it will, will be a different different models that will be tested out. So that, that work's ongoing and uh, we, we um, around about the provision for short breaks for individuals to support their families and themselves. So it's that, that work is testing out the different models is ongoing at the moment. Both in one of the things, both in terms of definitions and uh, these transitional issues, is, uh, as chair of the National Advisory Group, one of the things I was keen to do when the framework was being presented was seek assurances from experts, clinicians, and, uh, for example, the chief executive of the Children's Hospice Association that both our framework and the evidence summary had accurately reflected the issues in relation to definition. Um, the medical director of, of the hospice, um, the Children's Hospice, again, um, confirming that the government commitment um, to 0 to 25 age group was very much in keeping with their service model um, and, and the point around anticipation and transition we would expect as people transition uh, w who are living longer uh, with the sorts of conditions that CHAS clinicians are seeing um, that the, the commitments that we've made uh, for, for adults that they would obviously benefit from those too as they transition from the CHAS services and the, those uh, services to, to adult services. Thank you. Uh, Richard Lyle. <coughs> Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I turn to where is palliative care provided? I welcome your announcement in regards to the £3.5 million more allocated uh, to this, but it's been a concern of numerous people, and it's been raised several times about uh, the impact of care from home visits being limited to 15 minutes, and the committee recommended that you investigate this and I note that your comments, local authorities allocate care on the basis of an individual's assessment needs. Clear no one should have 15 minutes or shorter visits where it's not appropriate, where an instance a, medical, um, a medicine is being dispensed, etc. And you have uh, made an announcement in your papers, uh, coming back to the committee, you've said that the Scottish Government have developed a new joint inspection regime to ensure that people get the level of support through free personal care that they have been assessed as needing, the quality is no less that the people of Scotland deserve, and that you will implement inspections, including commissioning 
processes through councils that determine the volume and length of visits needed to develop safe, compassionate care services for Scotland's older people. I stay, uh, um, where I stay, I have a sheltered housing complex behind me. And I note on occasions when I, I'm going out or coming back into my home that uh, various care workers uh, are coming to visit clients in the area and, and several times during the day, but it's different workers, some in foot, some in car. Uh, and, and I think it could be actually organised better. What inspections do you intend to ensure that to, to, to develop and, and get away from this constant uh, comment that, that people are only getting 15 minutes of care per day. Okay, I mean, it was a, a, a big area in itself. I mean, people should get the, the care um, package that they require depending on the needs. So it should be um, needs led. Now, you know, a lot of work, as you've outlined yourself, has gone on to, to try to improve um, the quality and indeed the inspection around all of these issues. Um, including how councils commission services. I guess we're moving into kind of slightly new territory. Well, we are moving into new territory in the world of integration. So the um, health and care partnerships have had the, 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 the shadow year move into the, the kind of from the 1st of April into full, full integration. And I think that will make a big difference. Um, for example, I think the, the, the joined up nature of um, people working in multidisciplinary teams um, gives us the opportunity to get away from the someone's living room feeling like Socky Hall Street with you know lots of different people coming in. I think big improvements have already been made in that regard, but I think integration really helps us to take that to the next level. It also through the reform of primary care gives an opportunity for um, for the, the right professionals to be spending the right amount of time with someone in an, in, in an end of life or palliative care situation. You can see how important that will be where their needs are more complex. So through the work that is ongoing around um, the reform of primary care, freeing up the time of GPs to spend more time with more complex cases, making sure that the, um, the packages of care in its total sense that people receive are joined up, that they're multidisciplinary and that communication is good so that you know we, we minimise the different faces the person will see that there's more continuity of care. And all of that is a, a big opportunity. If we, if we get integration and we get the new um, uh, models of primary care right, um, and that as well as the framework which is um, but very important in the implementation of this is critical. So are all those other parts of that are happening, um, that are big changes that are in the process of happening or that are are coming. And we've we there is for for a palliative and end of life care. If we get that right, I think it could make a huge difference to the the quality of care that people receive right through their 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 life to end of life as well. We need to get that right. And, and I certainly agree with you, and, and, and through you, convener, that uh, you know the many aspects that have come on in the last uh, year or so are, are going to make hopefully a difference to, to to people's lives and also to people, you know, the care that they, they're going to uh, receive. So uh, you are confident that the inspections that the you know um, you know whilst this is carried out by local authorities, uh, you're confident that we can monitor what, what what's happening locally. We're all, well, inspections are moving more to a whole system approach, so we're trying to reflect the, ins the work of inspectors as the as the, the services change to be integrated. So rather than looking at, you know, um, for example, uh, just one element, if you look at the way older people's services are inspected, we're trying to do that across the whole range of older people's services to get a picture of what are older people's services like, not just the bit on the hospital side, but the whole thing. And I think the same can be said for palliative and end of life care. There is an opportunity to look at in inspecting services across the whole system. Um, and I think that makes more sense. And that's really the whole direction of travel of inspection. Yeah, we've um, um, 
a secured agreement in principle from uh, th three at the moment health and social care partnerships to test out how our commitments can be implemented and, and uh, those are Glasgow City, East Ayrshire um, and Western Isles with uh, another discussions ongoing with some other health and social care partnerships but one of the things we'd want to do is yes inspection is <coughs> important but in terms of getting continuous quality improvement we want the care staff to have access to information that can influence the day-to-day -day improvement so um, how many staff uh, um, were involved with somebody's care how long were they there for what did they do did it meet their needs so that the teams have these data to look at as part of our approach to improvement and um, so inspection is part of that but we found through other quality improvement work that if we um, allow the teams to have these data as part of our commitment to improving measurement that they can start to identify variation if people are um, perhaps uh, there's, there's more people than somebody wants to be involved in care or they're not getting all the time that they might want so that they can take the action there without waiting for an inspection further down that we empower the, the staff to improve as, as they go along. Thank you. Just on some of that looping back to the education and training um, and uh, I think we all know that uh, at, at that point somebody being cared at home for will see carers, home help, carers, social workers every day of the week, three times a day. They're, they're the people who provide the care. They see the doctor maybe once a fortnight, nurse, similar, similar terms. So in terms of inspection, what are we inspecting? Are we inspecting the basic principles of continuity of care? Because yeah, absolutely quality. Mm -hmm. I think the cabinet secretary is right. It can be too busy at some points, but almost more importantly, from personal experience, is how that person relates to that person who's mm -hmm. going in and delivering personal care. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. There's also yeah. the other factor of the care workers who don't get the professional support that clinicians and nurses do in terms of resilience. Mm -hmm. Those carers who haven't had, in the main, they've been trained in lifting and handling, et cetera, et cetera, but they've not had the training and education to understand maybe the palliative care, end of life care, and what they're dealing with. They use their, their instincts and their own personal mm -hmm. experience in that and, and provide empathy and whatever. They can be caring for those people for a long time and there's an issue of attachment, mm -hmm. which is recognised in nursing and clinician, but they don't. There's no support when that person dies or whatever, whatever. I'm just saying that workforce mm -hmm. to be the workforce that, that we need it to be needs to, to, to be considered in this hierarchy of clinicians and nurses mm -hmm. and whatever, whatever. The people who are delivering the care day in day out are not those highly trained, highly paid people. Uh, you know, and I'm hoping that the strategy. Mm -hmm. It reflects that in its education and training and support for those for, for, for those people delivering care. I agree. Um, you know, the work that Craig mentioned earlier about the triple SC mm -hmm. should help that, but we need to monitor that and make sure that um, that well, first of all, that, that that level of care is also recognised. You know, if someone has that wealth of experience in delivering mm -hmm. palliative and end of life care with um, as a care worker, I think you know there's. We need to look at opportunities to, to recognise that in terms of their skill level, but also to support them. Because you're right, people do get attached. Um, they've been maybe seeing that person every day, and then um, what support is there for the for the staff in a, a, an end of life situation? And absolutely, and it was an issue that, that came up in the meeting that I referred to earlier um, with colleagues at Healthcare Improvement Scotland, the Care Inspectorate um, and uh, Scottish Care, um, and there was an agreement uh, last week that the work we want to support in health and social care partnerships, that Scottish Care as a representative organisation would be involved in that for the reasons that you said, so that uh, the whole range of, of care workers are involved and that the issues that matter to them in providing high quality care are taken account of. Um, and just to pick up on, on the convener's point around outcomes, absolutely the measurement framework we want to develop needs to link with the health and wellbeing outcomes that are uh, part of the um, integration uh, work and legislation, but also develop some specific indicators for, for palliative and end-of-life care that, that relate to quality outcomes. So you, you all monitor the continuity principle? Yes. and That will be measured. How many 
different people that that person's had over a week or a month or so so what we want to do is we want uh, the the partnerships that we're going to support to test the local work to develop and test out measures and and certainly at, at those meetings happy to keep an eye on that and make sure that they are uh, doing that as part of their monitoring what mm. we don't want to do is impose uh, from, from the centre how or, or specifically what they measure um, but as I say because that's been identified by Scottish Care at the, the meetings um, yeah. it, it's already there on the list of things that we're looking to discuss with partnerships. I suppose I'm pressing you to, 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 to recognise that continuity of care is a priority and a principle that applies if that person was receiving end of life care or palliative care within the National Health Service why wouldn't that be a priority or a principle that's insisted upon and measured when then that person's receiving end of life palliative care in any other setting. Sure, it's, it's a fundamental, uh, fundamentally important aspect. Um, <coughs> uh, Janice may remember, but the voices work that, that I talked about, I'm sure, covers uh, that point too. So we would have multiple points to, to monitor that. But we can certainly keep the committee informed of the that work as it's taken forward and test it out, and we'll make sure that we hone in on that and the feedback to committee around continuity of care. One of the models that I've seen is used is that a, a note of who's going to go in to see a person every day is sent out to the individual or their family or their carers. So they, you could see at a glance, is it the same people that are going in every day or is there a different person every day or is it the same three over a period of a week that goes in every day? And that's a model I'm not sure if it's replicated across the country, but actually at a glance it's quite a simple yeah. mechanism yeah. to use and that anybody could see if the person doesn't have the capacity to... To understand that it, it's the same person they think it might be, so it's 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 quite. Yeah, a good I mean, thing. They, they personally think it yeah. is possible, yeah. and uh, the development of those workers and taking pride and being part Absolutely. of a, a palliative yeah. care team that can go on and mm -hmm. you know in specific cases, I think mm -hmm. there's all sorts of potential there and uh, and, and opportunities to release potential where mm -hmm. people there are people out there carers who are very good mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, providing that who mm -hmm. do it now, mm -hmm. uh, but they, it might not be recognised. Um, I'm going to move quickly to Malcolm Chisholm. Dennis, you want Malcolm? Well, I'll give you a supplementary and I'll, I'll test the patience of the, 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 the committee. Well, I'm getting this. I think you're right. from it, Malcolm. It, it was really yeah, just on that point. It, it was, it, I, I hear what the, the, the convener is saying and the responses, but, but surely um, we're looking at if it's uh, patient centred, it will be the, the most appropriate people going in at that most appropriate time in that person's care uh, because that will change. And, you know, the continuum of, of that does change quite often. So at one point you could have somebody with a, a very good specialist nursing background, but if the person suddenly recovers, then you may be back to social care. I mean, it's, and it's about making sure that the person's needs are kept on, under review. And if there's a requirement for more in, intense support as someone's care needs change, then that, of course, um, is what should happen. I, but, I've, you know, I think the, the convener was saying and I would agree with this is that where there is you know the the, the kind of basic care needs are, are being met that where possible the continuity of, of people involved in that is very very important because relationships are formed people get to trust folk and um, you know those are, are very very important in a very you know, personal care situation um, where the, where someone's in a, is quite vulnerable, so you know I I think we we want to make sure through um, the testing and the work that, that that we hold on to that continuity of care as being a, a key aspect and how we measure that we can take forward. You know, uh, Janice outlined one very simple way of of being able to to identify whether that's been the case or not, and we'll take that forward and happy to keep the committee informed. Malcolm. I'll move on to a, a couple of other points, but I, but I did want to uh, to focus on the health and social care partnerships uh, as well. Because, but you know, obviously, some of that's been dealt with already. And I, I was pleased that the first two uh, commitments of the Scottish government of the ten were about health and social care partnerships. And we've heard something about the work of Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Uh, and those recommendations talk about, ex, you know, providing expertise, guidance, and so on. But I suppose, I suppose, my, my the remaining question I would want to ask about that is just to what extent it's on the radar now, because we know that health and social care partnerships have a, a great many 
uh, commitments, um, you know, uh, to, 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 to deal with. So I'm sure all this will happen in due course, but to what extent is it on their radar uh, presently? And for example, the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care recommended that all health and social care partnerships should have an identified lead for palliative and end-of-life care, and that their partnerships should ensure that palliative care is included within their strategic and operational plans. So I wonder to what extent you were looking at their plans at this moment of time in terms of uh, their attention to palliative care. You know, obviously the plans are all there uh, for all this to happen in due course, but to what extent um, is it happen? You know, are, are they focused on that? Uh, at the start of their um, existence, as it were. Yep. Oh, you, know, you raise a, a, an important point. I mean, as you you know that the, the partnerships are required to produce a, a strategic commissioning plan by the, the 1st of April, covering all of its functions, which includes uh, responsibility for palliative and end-of-life care, both in hospitals and communities. Um, the legislation also, um, if you remember, sets out the requirements for um, in engagement as part of the strategic planning process so that the, you know, the third sector, um, uh, independent sector, all of the, the right people, um, including local communities, um, should uh, be able to um, be part of um, the, the engagement process um, around that. However, um, in terms of palliative and end-of-life care um, services, we will provide guidance specifically to support those partnerships um, with the development of the content of their strategic commissioning plans in relation to palliative and end-of-life care services. Um, officials, um, mainly Craig and, and Janice and, and, and others, but Janice and, and Craig being the key, are in the process of meeting each health and social care partnership now um, and have been and, and are continuing to to discuss um, progress on um, palliative and end of life care, um, including other issues as well. But but drawing that out as part of the um, items to be covered during those discussions. So so yeah, it is early days, but I think we've made it very clear, and there is an expectation with partnerships that palliative and end of life care. Um, is something we expect to see a focus on through the, the commissioning plans, that there is a plan laid out of how they're going to take that forward, what they're going to do, involvement of um, the, the third sector and independent sector, so that there's a coherent plan bringing in all of the, the providers um, um, and they can then be able to articulate and lay out what those local plans look like. So, uh, Craig, you've been more involved with the... Yeah, so, so uh, Janice and I are in daily contact with the integration team within Scottish Government who, who are linking and having these meetings with, with all of the partnerships because we, we want to uh, maintain the high levels of awareness that your inquiry and uh, that the framework um, have uh, resulted in um, the local delivery plan guidance that I mentioned earlier that the Chief Operating Officer of NHS Scotland has issued last week um, again is encouraging NHS boards to have these conversations with partnerships in their areas to again and um, keep this high priority and look at how their future plans are, are going to um, address this. Um, the Chief Social Work Advisor, Alan Baird, and I also attended a, a meeting with all the Chief Social Work Officers. Um, and um, I, I met with a health spokesperson spokesperson of the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives. Um, again, we, we're, we're, um, we're doing that really to, to ensure that all of the various different um, stakeholders and, and leadership groups um, that will influence the, the commissioning and the local plans are, are not only aware of, of the framework, but have the opportunity to connect and have our contact details so that we can connect them with the third sector organisations and, and with the, the areas uh, that perhaps are a bit further forward with some of this. Um, seeks to ensure that our future requirements of e-health systems support the effective sharing of individual end-of-life anticipatory care planning conversations. I, I think we had some discussion of this with some of our witnesses. So I suppose uh, um, the questions there might be um, um, what's on the record. And there was, we, we did have some issues there just about uh, how many different 
summaries, there seem to be emergency care summaries, palliative care summaries, inf key information system, anticipatory care plans, and so on. Uh, but then also who, who that would be shared with, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not really sure where e-health where e has got to currently, but to what extent is that going to be possible for that to be widely shared and to have um, the necessary information uh, on, on the record? Um, I'll let Craig answer some of the detail, but essentially it will be the key people um, who will require access to information to, well, for example, we talked earlier about someone ending up being uh, admitted into an acute setting, even with the, you know, with the, the best laid plans, sometimes things happen and someone may end up being admitted into an acute setting. It's very important that there is um, information available to uh, the, 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 the staff within that acute setting um, about the, the needs of, of the, 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 the person, particularly if they're in a, an end-of-life um, situation. Craig, do you want to say a little bit about where we've got to with the, the, the register and other stuff? Yeah, so, so I'll perhaps mention two, two areas that I've been involved with and then if, if it's acceptable, Janice could describe some of the specific conversations we've been having with the e-health colleagues about future systems. Um, so um, following the, the agreement to, to dismantle the quality outcomes framework in relation to GPs from the 1st of April, we have reached agreement with the British Medical Association and GP practices that they will continue to maintain some of the disease registers that include palliative care, which are linked very much with the key information summary. Um, I, I've also asked that some of the uh, clinicians working in community and hospital settings identify some of uh, the issues that they encounter, things that work well with the key information summary, but crucially as we design the future e-health systems, areas that need improvement, um, and, and certainly that's work that Janice has been uh, leading with uh, in relation to uh, e-health. Um, and, and perhaps you could comment a bit more on the future commissioning of the new systems. Yes, well, the, the key information summary at the moment, uh, there's a piece of work being commissioned just to make sure in its current uh, state that it's, it's being used, it's being accessed, how best practice could be spread, because we know that in certain areas in Scotland, uh, accessing the key information mm. summary, the electronic key information summary, is, is, is um, quite high and where it's, it's more challenging than others. So there's a piece of work, um, NSS, NHS National Services Scotland have been invited and commissioned to do a specific piece of work to, to look at that uh, rapidly. But beyond that, uh, a group has met already to start thinking through what the requirements might be about sharing the appropriate pieces of information across the health and care settings electronically so someone can access electronically what's appropriate to be able to access about an individual and their care preferences, some of the information that's captured on the anticipatory care plan and the electronic key information summary. So that piece of work has already started as well and uh, <coughs> colleagues in eHealth are, are pulling together a multidisciplinary team that will include colleagues from health and social care and integration uh, to start um, teasing out what the requirements might be going forward in the future. It might be that the key information is not the platform that's identified. It might be more than one platform that's already in existence where the, this, this can be like, it's just we're not clear what the outcome of this, this exercise will be, but that work's already started. I mean, we had a discussion about the register. I mean, to what extent is that? Is it very important to get more people on the register? There seem to be different views about that, but it, it was unclear to us why perhaps so many people didn't seem to get on the register, particularly if, for conditions other than cancer. But is, is that fairly crucial in terms of what you've been talking about, or is, is it not really so central as some people might think? I guess it goes back to one of the issues we were talking about earlier in terms of having uh, key elements of information available that allow um, conversations to take place so that if, if a care preference or key parts of information about the person's condition or uh, medication or, or uh, circumstances are available quickly, then uh, clinical and care staff can have the sorts of conversations that they're not able to have if it's taking a lot of time to get the information or it's not there at all. Um, so certainly what we've um, been, been told is that where the information is available, 
um, either on the, the register or accessible um, or updatable in secondary care settings that we do start to see an improvement in the the conversations with, with people living with the sorts of conditions we're, we're covering. We, we did some work in Lothian that we found that um, sometimes at the start of the work it was taking uh, it was medical staff up to an hour and a half to locate information in different systems um, if perhaps the key information summary wasn't accessible or there were IT problems we supported them with some improvement work and they reduced that to less than five minutes and reported a huge impact on the quality of care because they could then have an informed conversation uh, with people because they were on a register or the information had been uploaded so, so it's that link between e-health e and point of care that we really want to, to try and continue to support. And if I could uh, just ask one last question about um, funding. You, uh, Cabinet Secretary, talked about the, a review of hospice funding. I think we raised issues in our report about the funding of the children's hospice, but there's the more long-standing issue, obviously, about the contribution that NHS boards make. I think we found difficulty actually getting information about that, and it may be that there isn't a a common way of calculating that so it may be that it's difficult to compare board with boards but certainly the impression seems to be that some if not a majority of boards are not really um, contributing the 50 percent that I think was uh, agreed or required uh, many years ago so I just wondered what the, if you can comment on the current situation and what the review might involve. Well I, I think First of all, there's a, a, a few issues. Um, the um, obviously the issue with um, Chaz and um, both uh, Craig and, and Janice have have had regular uh, meetings with with Chaz. Um, just I and mean, I'm sure you're aware of this, but um, it's at NHS T side that currently commissions services from Chaz on behalf of the the 14 boards in Scotland, and. Uh, there's been a, a number of uh, joint meetings between NHS Tayside and, and CHAS. Um, and really what we would expect is that the um, the review of, of that agreement um, um, and taking that forward will be concluded uh, by the end of this financial year. I think. Yes. Yep. Um, and we've had some positive updates around uh, how those discussions between NHS Tayside and CHAS are going. So that's one um, issue. I mean, in terms of um, the, the hospice funding more generally, and that's why we felt it was important to announce the, the review of hospice funding as, as part of the implementation um, to look at um, addressing the disparity between children and adult hospices, but also picking up on, on some of those wider issues around making sure that um, you know, there is a kind of equity of, of contribution there. So, you know, the review, which I expect to probably, well, certainly I would want to be concluded, um, you know, by the end of this year, um, certainly and no later than that, should pick up on all those issues. Craig, do you want to say something? Um, we, we're fortunate to have a hospice quality improvement forum where a lot of the um, chief executives from the adult independent hospices uh, meet. Um, and, and certainly through th through that group and discussions um, around our commitment to support clinical and health economic uh, evaluations, we, we would want to um, address uh, this issue in terms of the level of funding and, and certainly learning from, from your work that it was very difficult to compare uh, the position across different parts of the country because of the, the differences in the way data, including financial data, were collected. Um, we've also asked uh, Professor David Clark, who uh, again you, you will know from his report to you and, and who worked with me and colleagues uh, on the framework, but uh, uh, Professor Clark and his team are completing a mapping exercise for us at the moment um, in terms of specialist palliative care services across the country, which will be available in April. Um, so we want to link that with financial data so that we can have a, an accurate description of service, but also um, with our health economic colleagues um, look at re evaluating models. Um, I uh, have Janice, both Janice and I have visited a number of models of care. For example, Strathcarden Hospice was uh, certainly one I visited, where they are collecting financial data around their hospice at home service. Um, so it is very much something that's part of our commitment to support health economic evaluation. We, we want to, to take forward and, and address some of the, the issues that your report highlighted. 
Do you think that that debate then will, will will encourage different models? I mean, I'm thinking you know, there's been some discussion, for instance, that you know empty empty wards um, in hospitals and and uh, you know the the cost of uh, to boards if it increases. Uh, to push that out, may consider providing palliative care wards in some of our general hospitals? Or? Well, I think we, we need to look at a whole range of models, but I suppose where I was thinking more um, that, that you know there's, there's scope for some new thinking is around the, the, the shift of focus on to primary and community care so if you think about the community hub model that we've been talking about bringing together a range of professionals um, there will some of the the models we look at the clip manager one that's already up and running they do have some inpatient beds as um, some of that may well be for uh, palliative and end of life care i know in the northwest highland they have a an agreement with them um, with a care home where there is, a, I think, it's supported by GP and nurses to provide palliative and end of life care on, on those commission beds. So there's various models, mm. um, and we need to, and, and, and actually, there probably won't be one size fits all. It will be perhaps a bit different in more remote and rural areas than it might be um, in a more urban setting. I think we need a bigger range of choices and to make sure that uh, there's a cap capacity is there. So you know, we'll need more hospice at home. We may need more, or probably will need more community-based um, end-of-life palliative care beds, um, for particularly for, for when things happen um, that might not require someone to go into an acute bed, but they require um, some additional support that might be difficult to deliver mm -hmm. in the home environment. So um, there, there will require to be an expansion of... Um, that the, these types of services, and I suppose um, there will be, you know, there'll, there'll probably be a range of of models of what that will look like. But we're definitely going to need yeah, more. I of suppose it. I'm just flagging up the issue that increased contributions from health boards doesn't necessarily equal increased finance mm -hmm. for specialist palliative care provided by hospitals. Hosp hospitals. I suppose that's. Well, because it's tended to be around that debate, isn't it? You know about, you know, the fifty percent has not been met, or you're not meeting fifty percent of what I consider my running cost. Mm -hmm. um, but even if we get a greater focus from the health service and health boards, it doesn't necessarily equal money going in there. It will be uh, to 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 represent uh, um, you know a broader model. Um, I mean, the hospice movement will always have a key role to uh -huh. play, no matter what other services are, are developed. You know, that, that the, the hospice provision will always be a kind of critical element. I suppose the point I'm making is that, we'll, you know, we need more. Um, we will need more of, of that mm -hmm. of provision. Um, and that will probably, we, you know, there are models to be tested out and there won't be one size fits all, but we will need greater capacity. Yeah. Um, for uh, probably in all all settings, to be honest. In, in one particular setting, that was an unusual setting that I saw was a mental health ward within a, a, a hospital, and it was hospital at home that actually delivered the specialist palliative care element of that care package, and how the board captured that and actually fed mm -hmm. that into their specialist palliative care spend, I'm not sure that that would actually. Um, filtered its way through to that, mm -hmm. that, that particular budget head. It was delivered, the care was delivered beautifully, but how you actually um, captured the actual spend, and that's where it gets quite complex, mm -hmm. because I think we said, and the committee recognised that palliative care and specialist palliative care will be delivered across many settings, and yeah. it's how you actually get those pockets and how they were funded and, mm -hmm. and reported. I don't, I don't, I don't disagree. I think I'm, just, I'm identifying maybe a, a, an anxiety within the hospice yeah. movement. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, we're, we're embarking in change. So, mm -hmm. you know, one particular value I think that hospices have got that they're very well regarded in mm -hmm. this area of delivery, and, and I suppose uh, you know that any progress that would be made, the, the the badge of even 
partnership or different models within a, you know, an Argown badge or a St Margaret's Hospice badge about that palliative care being delivered in the community is, is pretty important. Mm -hmm. And it would be pretty important to have that discussion with the hospices that you're going to be part of the future. You're not, yeah. you're oh, no, absolutely. And, and I want to absolutely reassure them that you know the, the, their role in, in this is absolutely critical. Uh -huh. uh, what we need to look at, though, is how do we expand services and, and what, what are the options around different models? Um, also harnessing some of the opportunities that are... That are uh, presenting themselves, you know, like uh, the um, if we get the new primary care model right, that GPs will have more time to spend with patients who need their time, perhaps in a palliative end of life care situation. So, you know, we we need to look at it in the round. I suppose is what I was. The, the measurement theme we've we've been uh, talking in fact just this week around how we support the hospices to better use the data that they collect so that they can describe the services that they provide but crucially around palliative care have, um, being something that um, uh, more people have access to that we do that in a way that allows us to uh, use the expertise we have in Scotland around data linkage so that if somebody's cared for by a hospice we get the data around what care they are providing but we can then start to link it with our other information systems um, the committee will be aware of the Marie Curie work that was done based on English data around the uh, approximately 11,000 people in Scotland who might benefit from palliative care um, in order for us to take that work forward in Scotland we have to have the data linkage between hospices and the other systems so that this week we, we think we've identified a, a way that we can um, again with, with uh, uh, quite a high degree of urgency and pace start to see how to link the data for the hospices uh, and plug them into this more effectively. Fiona McLeod. Thank you. Um, I'm aware of time moving on. Um, I just wanted to briefly return. Rhoda Grant was talking about young adults and uh, the support that we give them as they move through, the, through life. And I think it was Janice Burrell that mentioned about some respite available for uh, young adults with long-term or life-limiting li conditions but are living longer with them. And I know that you're doing some pilot work with Marie Curie, with Chaz and at Lukey House. And I just wondered if you had time scales on when you'd be able to report on these pilots. Um, I know that the, the first pilot was held just towards the end of last year and I've not seen any of the outputs from how they're actually evaluated. But there was a group of, of uh, young men went to Lukey House to, to trial out uh, a, a short break, respite break there. And I was actually at the meeting before the break happened and I know that the, that, uh, the, the Lukey House were very keen to to tease out what, what was required and what they would, would have in place to help support the short break. But the, the, the transition teams that Chaz is linking in um, across, I know that they've done that they've been looking to link in with some work in Highland uh, and, and what they're doing around about planning and mapping out how transition might look for them for their young adults. Um, so the Chaz team is, is currently looking at their current cohort but also what plans they would have in place for, for youngsters coming up to that age and that they need to transition on. So that, that's work. I think that team's only been in place just over a year now. So they have done a huge amount of work in a short space of time. But is that something that you could keep the committee updated yes. on? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, from my recent visit to Lukey House, uh, I have to say I was very impressed by the, the level of care needs that they can manage uh, there. And they have... Apart from anything else, the, the environment is great and they do a lot of um, activities, provide a very good quality uh, respite um, opportunity. Um, and But what struck me was that very high level of, of need that they can manage, which is not the case in many other uh, respite places. So I was very impressed indeed. Thank you. Is there no other questions for the from the committee, can I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary's attention and our, and our colleagues for a, uh, an interesting session. Thank you very much indeed. We now go into um, private session as previously agreed. <laughs>